Welcome to the NXT Podcast, your home for weekly NXT reviews and insights. The beautiful part of NXT is that when one dream ends, another dream begins. Find all of your NXT news, recaps, and analysis right here. So with that being said, we only have one question for you. Are you We thought so. Let's get the show started right now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the NXT podcast. My name is Zachary Smith. I am your host here once again. And once again, I cannot thank you enough for joining me here again this week to review your NXT from this past week. I say it every week, but that's because I still can't quite believe I'm here talking to you, uh, that I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to come into your homes through your devices each and every week. This is going to be a good show here today. And I say that for two reasons. Number one, because we had a very good NXT show to go over. That's always good. That always makes my job a little bit easier. And what makes my job a little bit harder is that part of this show is going over the news of the week. And prior to yesterday, I had plans on talking about some of Edge's comments. I had plans on talking about Ronda Rousey. I had plans on talking about a few things. But, as I'm sure you all know, some things happened yesterday. And amongst other things, we had... A lot of releases in the WWE, and I I have the unfortunate honor of being the uh, first to kind of cover it here. And rather than go over it in a a broad sense, I'm just going to present you here with some facts. I'm, I'm not even going to stick to opinions at this point. I just want to give you facts as I see them. Yesterday we were hit with a lot of releases. This is by no means a complete list. But some of the first names that came out, we have Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, the OC. You'll remember as one of the most popular teams in Japan as part of the Bullet Club. One of the best group of workers in Japan that came over to the WWE made a big impact upon their debut, and because Vince McMahon doesn't like tag teams, they went nowhere. For a while, they went nowhere before they re-signed, and rather than take a deal with a company that would give them better opportunities, they made the decision for them, for their families, for their co-workers, to stay with World Wrestling Entertainment. Not long after that, Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows were released, presumably without notice, Presumably without a lot of time to make a backup plan. Drake Maverick was also on the list of releases. Drake Maverick, again, just sticking to the facts, is a guy that came from total nonstop action wrestling for a chance to compete with World Wrestling Entertainment, turned himself into one of the better general managers that we've seen in a long time. Along with William Regal, he was one of the people that you were actually excited to see as a general manager of a show. He did not get overly involved in storylines, He was just a credible general manager until he was saddled with the responsibility of being the manager for the Authors of Pain. I suspect because Vince McMahon thought it was funny that a short guy was the manager of two tall guys. And then because Vince McMahon has a terrible sense of humor, he was put into an angle where he wet himself on television. And for some reason, after that, he wasn't taken as seriously. I couldn't tell you why. And then after that, he rebuilt himself with his feud with R-Truth for the 24-7 title to such a point that he even got his wife multiple gigs on TV with it. He used his own wedding as a backdrop for the 24-7 title. A title, I'll remind you, which means nothing. It's a comedy title, He still took it seriously enough to dedicate that to it. He gave everything to everything that he did, and he was entertaining in everything that he did. Kurt Hawkins was released. You remember Kurt Hawkins 
had the gimmick of an edge head the first time. He was released. He came back to WWE. His whole gimmick was he lost a lot. And he made that interesting. He made the gimmick of he does not win interesting. Which not a lot of people can do. A lot of the history of wrestling is guys not wanting to lose simply for the fact that it ruins your character and can ruin your credibility in the fans' eyes. This is a person who took that and turned it into a positive for him. Up until he was released by World Wrestling Entertainment. Again, with no warning, and presumably without time to make a plan. Heath Slater was released. You'll remember Heath Slater having just been on the bump talking to Drew McIntyre about people being proud of him, a very emotional moment between the two. Heath Slater, having gone through the original group of NXT superstars to the three-man band, to being somebody that was not drafted on Raw or SmackDown in the Superstar Shakeup, to somebody who was the hottest free agent in all of wrestling, and somehow got that over and got the fans to care. Entered a tag team tournament on SmackDown with Rhino, became the SmackDown Tag Team Champions with Rhino, and fans loved it. He took nothing, and he made it into something. Ethan Carter III was released. You'll remember that Ethan Carter III also came from total, non-stop action wrestling to be in world wrestling entertainment. Now, you would think, based on his look, based on his ability, and based on his promo, he would be somebody that Vince McMahon would love. He started in NXT. He felt like he belonged in NXT. He felt like a big deal promo-wise. In the ring, he felt like he should be on the main roster. He was finally drafted to the main roster, where for some reason, as Vince McMahon tends to do with new toys, he gets bored of them very quickly. And when Vince McMahon gets bored with new toys very quickly, his writers also get very bored with new toys very quickly. Because of that, Ethan Carter III was relegated to not doing anything, not speaking, and being one of the losers that would run after the current 24-7 champion, generally not winning it. This is one of the few people that I think is going to be better off by being released, because somebody will actually use his talent in the way that it should be used, as, you know, a professional wrestler, for example, would just be my thoughts. I don't own a wrestling company. People in those positions are often like to take the stance of, well, you buy a wrestling company and operate it for 20 years and have it be as successful, and then we can talk. And aside from the fact that that is a straw man argument and not at all what we are discussing, I would think that if I ran a wrestling company, I doubt that I could take it to the heights Vince McMahon did, but I do think that I could figure out that if I have a very good professional wrestler that is a very good talker, and I have a television show where I promote wrestlers who talk, I would maybe allow that wrestler to wrestle and talk, or I'm sorry, I would allow that superstar to speak to the WWE Universe so that not only that superstar can get more of a fan base and get more over, but my TV show can feature more people. Because I don't know if you noticed, we're having to lean on 50-something-year-old Goldberg in big spots because for some reason we refuse to let people do what it is they do well. Lance Storm was released. You'll remember that Lance Storm has been in the company about four months. Lance Storm just closed his wrestling school, just finished up his last group of wrestlers. He closed that school down. He was an agent with WWE. And inexplicably, Lance Storm, after closing his school and giving up that stream of livelihood for himself to help out WWE in a way that they certainly needed, and certainly could use, just decided, you know what, we'll go ahead and release him. Fit Finley, in the same way, not only a pioneer in the ring, but ask any woman on any brand, and they will tell you that Fit Finley had a huge part in getting them where they are. Eric Rowan, who got over as a big monster that was intelligent when he was next to Daniel Bryan, And stop me if you've heard this before. Vince McMahon got bored of his new toy, had him off TV for a few weeks, and then came back with something in a cage. We knew it was going to be stupid. It was a giant tarantula. Drew McIntyre crushed it. And now Eric Rowan is released. 
as far as I can tell, for doing a good job and being given a stupid story that didn't get over. Sometimes it's not the person that didn't get something over. Sometimes you had a bad idea and don't want to admit it. We've released Shane Helms and Kurt Angle. We've released Legends. We've released Aiden English, who was an excellent commentator. We released Mike and Maria Canellis, who have two kids, one they just had. They released Leo Rush, who was one of the most promising young superstars that they had on the roster. They released Mike Kyoto, who had been the longest tenured referee with World Wrestling Entertainment, and was released unceremoniously. The other facts I want to present you with are that World Wrestling Entertainment is the number one wrestling company in all of not only the United States, but the world. World Wrestling Entertainment pulls in a lot of money. Disregarding their TV deals, having just signed with Fox and getting an astronomical amount of money for a TV show that frankly has not earned that amount, they have Raw, they have NXT, they have other shows, they have original content, they have WWE Network subscribers, they have a deal with Saudi Arabia to do shows there each month. Each few months, rather. They have all of these revenue streams coming in. They have a YouTube channel. Through a confluence of events a few days ago, a donation was made on behalf of the McMahons, and miraculously, poof like magic, the WWE was deemed a quote-unquote essential service. To the most optimistic of us, maybe higher-ups realized that Entertainment is essential right now, and putting smiles on people's faces is what matters in these hard times. A pessimist might think that they made a sizable donation to the right people to get their names on an essential list because they're too stubborn to shut down for the safety of their employees. That would also be something that you could say in a situation like that, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Those are the facts of what has happened. I say that to say you could have done a couple of things here. You could have you could have just taken time off. You could have run original content, you could have still run stories, you could have done a lot of things. You could have kept operating as normal because with that 18 to 20 million that you donated, you could have paid all of your superstars and kept operating as normal. You could have done so many things before we got to mass releases of people that could have helped you. Frankly, you could have released one person. You could have released a Goldberg, who is 50+, plus, has never been a good wrestler, or a good talker, or a particularly good locker room guy from everything I have ever heard about him or seen about him in any network special that they have run, which generally makes you like somebody more. But, in fairness, we did need him to beat The Fiend for the Universal title so that he could lose it to Braun Strowman in a couple of minutes at WrestleMania. That was very, very important. The point here is that there was a lot of things that could have been done. And even if nothing had been done, the company would have gone on as normal. This is not 1985, where Vince McMahon had to mortgage his own home on WrestleMania 1. And if WrestleMania 1 does not work, this company does not go on. This is not the situation that we are in. We are in a situation with a company that miraculously got themselves deemed an essential service. And the first thing they did after getting themselves deemed an essential service is cut a bunch of their workers in a business where there are no live crowds, there are no shows going on, and it's likely going to be hard for a wrestler to find wrestling jobs. Aside from this being a business move and cutting costs, which it certainly will, this is certainly the worst thing you could have done in terms of just being good people. And I understand that business and being good people don't always go together. But I think in this case, when it's very, very easy to be a good business person and 
just be a good person, I'm the kind of person that is going to want to be a good person as well. But I see that the higher-ups in the world wrestling entertainment are not those kind of people. Now, I understand I just yelled at you for 15 minutes about WWE, but I felt that needed to happen. That was something that had been bothering me since we saw it online and discussed it a bit. Let me know what you think. I I think I made myself pretty clear. But on to happier things. We do have a fantastic edition of NXT to discuss this week, and we're going to do that right now. We start the show with a recap of the latter match for the number one contender for the women's title, won by Io Shirai, and a few clips of Ciampa and Gargano last week, Gargano winning that with help from Candice LeRae. And we see a couple of clips of Io Shirai with the briefcase and Charlotte Flair with the NXT title. And we start the show proper with Finn Balor's entrance. It occurs to me that he seems to be the best that he's been since he came back to NXT and turned heel. He was great in NXT the first time, obviously. He was great when he first got to Raw and was the first ever Universal Champion, but then unfortunately got hurt. And when he did come back, didn't quite feel the same for obvious reasons he had been moved out of that spot and moved on to a different role but since coming back to nxt he now feels like a part of nxt and since turning heel he's more of a dynamic character frankly he's more interesting he's more intense in the ring it feels like he's been unleashed a bit more and he has more character things to do than just being a more bland kind of babyface And then commentary emphasizes to us that Finn has his eyes set on the UK champion, Walter. We've been setting up this match for a bit now. Obviously, it's a bit hard to set up given the circumstances here. But we do have Finn Balor going up against Fabian Eichner from Imperium. Is Finn Balor just a bit ago beat Alexander Wolf, also from Imperium, on NXT UK. So it seems as though we're going to kill some time here by going through the members of Imperium. So it's Fabian Eichner up next. He's accompanied by Marcel Bartel. Imperium's a very cool group. They're they're very kind of militant and efficient. There's not a lot of wasted movement in their kind of entrance. It's very proper, but also intense, which is an interesting juxtaposition between the two. Before they lock up, Eichner says, if you want to get to Walter, you got to go through me first. And he does. It's a short match, but it's pretty good. Uh, it seems like it's certainly not a takeover match. They, it's definitely a TV match, but Eichner has the strength advantage. Finn Balor has the speed. And Finn eventually does get the coup de grace and then the 1916 to pin Fabian Eichner. He's walking up the ramp. He just says into the camera, Walter, let that serve as a preview of what will happen when our paths cross again. I don't know when, I don't know where, but be ready. And we cut to the back. The Velveteen Dream is sitting on a couch and commentary. Tom Phillips and Byron Saxton indicate that he's waiting for a face-to-face with Adam Cole, who they say has not arrived to the building yet. And we get announcement that Charlotte Flair is going to be addressing the women's division next. Yay. First, we have Tegan Knox versus Raquel Gonzalez. And we get clips of two months or so ago of Raquel Gonzalez debuting and costing Tegan her match against Dakota Kai when they were having a match as part of that feud. So now we're getting Tegan and Raquel. So this match was... Very short and very simple. This was one of the WWE matches that is not a match so much as it is a short story that they're telling. The story here is that Raquel Gonzalez was dominating this match from start just about to finish. Tegan got very little offense in. She was selling, which she's great at, so that works. And when Raquel would go for a pin, Tegan would kick out and show fire. There comes a spot where Tegan is draped over the top rope and the referee is distracted and Dakota Kai runs up on the apron and kicks her. Raquel goes for the cover and it's only a two. And then Shotzi Blackheart comes out 
to even the odds and attacks Dakota Kai, takes her out with her helmet. Raquel reaches over the top rope and grabs Shotzi by her hair and pulls her up. She grabs her by the throat as if she's about to choke slam her, but as she lifts her up, Tegan rolls Raquel up and gets the three count. So we emphasize that Raquel was physically dominant in the match. Tegan still was opportunistic and got the best of her. And we have an interesting situation now where it's Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox evening the odds against Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez. Not sure if we're just setting up a tag match there, what we're setting up, but that could be interesting going forward and still a continuation of Shotzi Blackheart becoming a bigger deal than I think she was ever intended to be, but sometimes you have a performer that just kind of shines through whatever they're doing. So this could be interesting. And we have Charlotte Flair in a pre-recorded interview segment. She says, it's great to call your shot. She went to WrestleMania and beat Rhea. She said, make no mistake, Rhea is the future, but I'm not going to let it go that easy. She said she's come back to dominate three different eras, the past, the present, and the future. She's beaten the best in NXT the first time to win the women's title. She ended Nikki Bella's historic title reign. It's technically true that was historic, but feels weird calling that historic. But she beat Nikki Bella. She beat Paige. She beat the best of the women's division. And now she's back to run through the best women's division in the WWE, which is NXT. I tend to agree with her. She says that she has her eyes on Mia Yim because Mia was her first opponent in NXT. And they've come a long way since then. She said she's going to be generous and give Mia the first lottery ticket. And then when I win, Regal can line them all up and I'll knock them down. So the weird thing here is that Mia Yim has lost almost all, if not all, of the matches that she has been a part of since as long as I can remember now. She's been in interesting stories, but she always seems to lose. So one... It's weird that she would be somebody that's in a championship match. But two, it's weird to start Charlotte Flair off with somebody that I know has no chance to beat her. That just seems like... I mean, it's it's certainly good for Mia Yim to be in a spot like that. But as far as a championship view, that already feels flat to me based on how they've used Mia Yim. It would be... The equivalent of having like a Dolph Ziggler in a championship match when all I really see him do is lose, and I know that's what he's going to do anyway, but okay. Mia Yim first, and then presumably at some point we'll have Io Shirai and Rhea Ripley's looming on the horizon coming back, so hopefully one of those will take the championship back. I already give him my thoughts there. Charlotte shouldn't have won it. Not going to beat that into the ground this week. Pinky promise. We're going to move on. Guts over to Jordan Devlin being stuck in Ireland. And so we're crowning an interim cruiserweight champion. And we're having a title tournament. We have Kushida. We have Drake Maverick. It feels so weird having him in this tournament now. We have Tony Nese. We have Jake Atlas. We have Isaiah Swerve. Scott. We have Jack Gallagher. We have Tozawa, we have El Hio del Fantasma, and it's a Group A, Group B deal. And the tournament starts tonight with Tozawa versus Swerve. And so it seems as though we basically have a New Japan tournament here, where we have a Group A, Group B. They're going to be facing, I think it's three other people in their own bracket, and whoever has the most wins at the end wins their group. The winner from Group A faces the winner from Group B. The winner of that becomes the interim champion, and then presumably that person would face Jordan Devlin, and that person is the cruiserweight champion proper. Cut to Matt Riddle on the phone backstage. I believe he's talking to Pete Dunn. He's trying to find out who his tag team partner is going to be, as Pete Dunn's unable to travel for the NXT title match. So it seems as though Matt Riddle doesn't even know who his tag team partner is going to be. So it looks like we're all going to find out together. So, Tozawa and Swerve have a very good match. This felt like an opening Cruiserweight Classic match. 
So if this is what we're going to get from the whole of the tournament, I am absolutely in. Uh, Swerve Scott, again, had a strength advantage on Tozawa. And Tozawa had more speed and had kind of more targeted submissions that kind of wore Swerve down. And eventually, Tozawa kind of does a belly-to-belly into the corner. He's standing very close to it and threw Swerve into the corner and hits that top rope senton to get the first win. So the only two records we have so far is Tozawa is 1-0 and zero, and Swerve is 0-1. and one. And So we'll continue the tournament each week it seems like now and then whoever wins will go as we go. And Tozawa does a quick interview after it was very short, just says he must keep fighting, keep winning, and become cruiserweight champion again. Seems like he's dropped the trying to get the crowd to chant thing that he used to do for obvious reasons. There is no crowd. It would be hard to get them to do it. But it definitely does make him feel more serious and more of a threat. I don't think he's going to win the tournament, but it definitely makes it a better tournament to have more serious competitors in it. And I think... Tazao is going to be really good for it. Every time Tazao is in a match, he impresses. People tend to forget about him because he's not the most prominent character on the show, but he makes things better, plain and simple. Swerve does the same. And so we have a promo for Elio, as he's probably, along with Jake Atlas, the newer person in this tournament. And it's in Spanish with subtitles. It kind of goes over some of his history in the wrestling business. And where he's been up to this point and basically saying that he wants to start his NXT career by winning the Cruiserweight title. It's filmed at night. He's wearing a suit. It's it's cool looking. He's got his mask on. Looks like he's going to be a cool addition to this kind of division. It'd be interesting to see what they do with him kind of going forward. And so, as I said, we have the Shotzi Blackheart, Tegan Knox situation. We have that set. And then we have our next match, and that's Dexter Loomis. And I haven't seen a lot of Dexter Loomis. Uh, I generally watch the Hulu cut of any show that I'm watching, and he hadn't made the Hulu cut the last time he was on TV. And so this was one of the first times I've seen this. You already know this, obviously, but dude has crazy eyes. It seems as though the WWE has locked onto that because they're, they're doing that thing they did with Nia Jax where they get close on the eyes and just kind of do that. And so what I'm hoping is that they develop this character more than that because they never really did that with Nia Jax. They just still kind of do the same thing. And so hopefully this character kind of goes somewhere past that to Hootie Miles is going to be the opponent for Loomis I had the thought of just sorry in advance because this isn't going to go great for you and Loomis kind of has like a psycho thing going on it, it seems he seems off and he seems really angry and a little bit like he just killed someone and then just came out to the ring like it was nothing like it wasn't even a big deal He killed somebody and then was like, heard his music and was like, all right, well, let's go do this too. And part of his deal is that he's going to be very physical. All of his punches, you could hear them. And it's a very short match to Hootie Miles starts building some offense and then Dexter Loomis catches him in a spine buster. And then basically does, it's like a sit down Uranagi slam. So it's a Uranagi slam that kind of ends up like a sidewalk slam. And he keeps a hold of the position and then locks in an anaconda vice. Doesn't seem like it has a name yet. I'm sure it will. But right now it's that long name I just said. And Dexter Loomis wins, obviously. So definitely, I'm interested to see where the character goes. It's definitely different. There's a lot of possibilities you could do with this character. Just hope that it gets more development as we're going along. Because... You have a great talent in Dexter Loomis, and you have a very interesting character for him. So now it's just a matter of what we're doing with him next. 
So the dream is still waiting on the couch, and now he's frustrated. And it's at this point in my my notes I just wrote, the dream is still waiting on Adam Cole like a loser. It would seem to me that if you're waiting on somebody to come out and they still haven't showed up and you're frustrated, I'm not sure why you're still sitting there. It just kind of makes you look like you're just you're waiting on him for no reason. And of course it cuts to a video of Adam Cole. He's not there. Saying, you didn't think I was actually going to show up, did you? He again says that Dream doesn't deserve a title shot. It's basically the same thing as last week. And last week, I said we really needed to start having some kind of development with this story. Uh, That's not what we did here. Uh, We made Dream look kind of stupid. And then Adam Cole didn't show up again. And has reiterated that Dream doesn't deserve a title shot. And in fact, nobody deserves a title shot. So, we're still not sure where we're going with that. We know we'll end up at Dream versus Adam Cole, we would think, but we're not making any steps toward that. So, Dream finally comes out. I'm not sure why he didn't just do that to start with. If I was waiting on somebody, I would just come out to the ring. That's what people generally do in WWE, is just come out and call them out. And he's cutting a promo on Adam Cole, Basically saying, you call yourself the leader of NXT, but all I see is that you're the lone champion of NXT. He says, you're a great champion. You're maybe the best NXT champion ever. Certainly the longest rating NXT champion ever. And as he's cutting this promo, the camera's just straight on and it tilts to the side a bit. And it shows that Finn Balor has come out from the back and he's just standing in the back staring at Dream. Earlier, Dream said Adam Cole might be the best NXT champion of all time. And Finn says, I don't know you. I don't like you. I haven't said one word to you. So here's my first. When you talk about the greatest NXT champion of all time, you're looking at him. So be careful before your words get you a date with the prince. And of course, he is starting to walk away and Dream has a great line. He says... Well, why doesn't the prince be a gentleman and pick up the dream, let's say, next week? Tom Phillips on commentary says it sounds like it's a date. So, next week, seems like we're getting Velveteen Dream versus Finn Balor. So, I mean, that'll be an excellent match, certainly. You would hope that Undisputed Era does something during or after the match to kind of continue that story. Because again, while this did end up with a great match, this is not continuing our story at the moment. But hopefully we do get that. And obviously Finn is always great. The dream is always great. So I'm excited to see that match. That'll certainly be fun to go over next week. Next we have Roderick Strong and Bobby Fish from the Undisputed Era versus Matt Riddle and a mystery partner for the NXT Tag Titles. So Pete Dunne obviously couldn't make the trip over, so Matt Riddle's going to have a mystery partner. And Matt Riddle comes out after the Undisputed Era. He has both tag titles. And Pete Dunne comes up on the Titan Tron with a pre-recorded video and says he wishes he could be there, but unfortunately he can't. But he found somebody that's just as hard-hitting and just as tough as nails, and his name is Timothy Thatcher. And so... Matt Riddle's also surprised, so it seems like Pete Dunne didn't tell him who it was. So it's a good thing he found somebody, because otherwise Matt Riddle would have just been left there, kind of just without a partner. So it's a good thing Pete Dunne found somebody. It's weird that Pete Dunne was better at finding Timothy Thatcher than Matt Riddle, when presumably they were in the same building together. But it's a good thing that there's like an adult in that tag team to find a partner. And Timothy Thatcher's finally here. We heard about his signing a while ago. There's a lot of excitement going into it, and we didn't know where he was going to fit in, and we still don't really know, but for the time being, because Pete Dunne can't be here, Thatcher seems like a good replacement. He comes out onto the uh, ramp, and Matt Riddle's very excited. He goes for a fist bump, but Thatcher just walks past him in tents and takes off his jacket and walks into the ring. And then we have what ends up being a really good match. Uh, We had a little bit of sloppiness at the end with Bobby Fish and Roderick Strong. I don't know if it was just a 
bad night at the office, or if it's that, it's usually Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly. And I would imagine it's a situation where if you're in a tag team, that's the kind of situation where you're used to being in that team with the same person. And all of a sudden you get a different person in there and it throws off the chemistry a bit. They're going for the high low and it, 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 the timing wasn't quite right between them. So I think it was just a timing thing where they haven't had a lot of chances to work together the same way O'Reilly and fish have, but we, Get through, still a really good match, like I said, and Thatcher ends up tapping out Roderick Strong with an arm bar. And so Matt Riddle and Timothy Thatcher have retained the NXT Tag Team titles. And so technically, Timothy Thatcher has debuted as a champion who retained his title, which, if we've ever seen that before in wrestling, that's it's been a long time since somebody has both debuted and had a successful title defense in the same night. That's an interesting one. But Timothy Thatcher fits right in with NXT. He fits right in with the working style. He fits right in with intensity. He fit right into a big moment. He didn't feel out of place. He felt he felt like if there had been a crowd, you could say this for anything, but if there had been a crowd, it would have felt like an even bigger deal than it did. As it was, I was excited, but... You really do underestimate how important that crowd reaction is to something like a debut. But I think we have big things for Timothy Thatcher in NXT here. So hopefully we get to see more of that going forward. And so last part of the show, we see Champa. It looks like he's it looks like it's set up in such a way that he's recording either off of his phone or off of a camera that he's set up on himself just in the back and he's sitting on some recording equipment. And he still looks kind of defeated mentally and he basically is going over. He says he's done with this. He says, I'm done with Johnny. I'm done with all of this. He says, you know, we both agreed that when this was over, it was over. And it's over. And you were the better man. Seems like it's hard to, for him to kind of say that, but he he does say, Johnny, you were the better man. And he says, Johnny and Candice, you show the world who you really are. And he doesn't get to finish because the promo's interrupted. Because he is grabbed from behind and falls backwards. And as he does, the camera also falls over. And you hear... Somebody attacking Champa. It sounds vicious as hell. It sounds like somebody's really beaten the hell out of Champa bad. Like worse than a normal. I don't know if it was because they were right near the camera or why, but it sounded bad. And the camera is settled, and you see Champa kind of fall into frame because he has been beaten down and he's unconscious. And then you see Killer Cross kind of slither up behind him. He's on his stomach. And Killer Cross looks down at Champa and just says, Tick Tock. And the last shot you see is an unconscious Champa. You see Killer Cross above him. And you see, looks like a high heel. And so. I said last week that Killer Cross was going to be doing something with Champa or Gargano. Looks like it's Champa first. So it looks like we're getting heel Killer Cross with face Champa. This was a hell of a way to start it off. That was a very unique way to attack somebody that I haven't seen a lot of. So that was excellent. It felt vicious. It felt like he was hurt badly. You didn't get to see it. So your imagination gets to run away with it a bit. I think that helps. And, hey, Killer Cross is here, and it's a big deal to go against Champa. Champa is a top guy in NXT. Don't let the loss to Johnny fool you. He's 1A or 1B in NXT right now. And so, coming out against Champa means they have some big plans for you going forward. And the TikTok and the high heels, the last thing we see is the camera fades to black, and another episode of NXT is off the air. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that means that it's about it for me. 
I have to thank you again for joining me here. I have to thank you for listening to me rant for 10 or 15 minutes about people being cut. You don't need me to tell you this, but obviously there may be more releases to come, and all we can do as fans is support these wrestlers that have given their their time and their blood, sweat, and tears and their time with their families away for this company that clearly does not care about them as people and maybe visit Pro Wrestling Tees and buy a t-shirt or see how else you can help out your favorite wrestler because a lot of people are in situations where they aren't working. I've been fortunate. I work at a grocery store. We're not closing. But a lot of people aren't that fortunate. And if you're a professional wrestler, you're in a situation where now you've been cut and you don't necessarily have a job lined right up. There's not a lot of shows going on right now like there normally would be. And a lot of these people have families, and this is how they provide for them. Some of them are actors and musicians and comedians and so on and so forth. Some of them are just wrestlers. And if you're a wrestler who's just been released and has a non-compete, and there's not a lot of choices, you could be looking at a hard time. So like I said, if you can help support your favorite wrestler, do so. Otherwise, just stay safe out there. Ladies and gentlemen, as I say every week, this still doesn't feel real. It still feels like my first week doing this show. It's still my favorite part of my week. I hope it's a fun part of yours as well. Again, if you want to hit me up, I'm Zach NXT. That's Z-A-C-H-N-X-T on Twitter. You've got myself and the other members of the WWE podcast. We're Usually on Twitter, interacting with fans, talking about wrestling, talking about what's going on. Myself, my grand Ashley, a few of us were talking about what happened yesterday. We had something, a little thread going on, and that was a lot of the inspiration for what you heard at the beginning of the show. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything you want to hear in the show, hit me up on Twitter, ZachNXT. If it's good, we'll... Add it to the show. If it's something interesting we need to talk about, we will talk about it. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.